So to my immediate right, I have Christopher Peterson and, Hi, Sa and Sandy Powell, who are nominated for The Irishman. Then we have Ariane Phillips, who is nominated for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Then to her right is Jani Tamim, who is nominated for Judy. And then on the far right, we have Maze C. Rubeo, who is nominated for Jojo Rabbit. I thought I'd open generally first with um, the initial discussions for the films that you're involved with. First of all, Christopher and Sandy, could you talk about the first conversation with, with Martin Scorsese that you had? Go for it. <laughs> well, um, this is a film, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, about gangsters and the period covers between 1940-something to the present day. And the first thing that Marty said to us was that these aren't the gangsters that um, we're used to seeing in his films. They're not your good fellas. They're not your casino, flashy gangsters. They're more sort of um, under, the, under the radar. They need to sort of blend into the background a bit um, and look more like everyday guys, really. Anything else can you add to that? I think he said it. <laughs> <laughs> Ariane, you and Quentin Tarantino. Well, the first conversation we had was really in my interviews, first time working with Quentin. And um, we talked about our mutual experiences with, we're the same age, we're born in the same year, and we both were raised around Los Angeles. So I was raised in the Bay Area, and he was raised outside of LA. And just that experience of being kind of a seven-year-old kid um, and what that lens is like about Hollywood in 1969, and um, kind of all the, the, the mystique around that and how the culture was changing. And Johnny and Rupert Gould. Uh, when I met Rupert, uh, I had, uh, I was quite afraid to start something like Judy Garland, you know, because it's such a, a monument. And I knew Renee because I had worked with her on Bridget Jones. And I remember saying to Rupert, well, it's a big challenge to have to make Judy Garland, René looking like Judy Garland. And he said to me, uh, well, uh, we honor Judy Garland, but it's actually René Selweger, which is the most important. She is the star, and we have to make her feel extraordinary. And I thought it was a very good advice. Amazing. A big part of the approach was not to make a gloomy uh, movie, rather than you know just focusing to the characters like Scarlett uh, Johansson a character. We we believed we like to believe that she came from a very eclectic group of artists in the uh, 40s, and then she uh, hang with uh, you know artists from the Cubism or Orphism or you know, all the uh, incredible currents, avant-garde currents that existed uh, in, those, uh, in those years, even during the war. Um, all of this came with a lot of color. I mean, we might think that World War II was only like, you know, very groomy, but it was very also colorful. So we added that to that. Thinking about Judy, um, Jenny, and Renee, and you mentioned that you worked with her previously, um, and I know that um, she has a very different physique to Judy Garland, and I was reading about the fact that she altered mm. her own physique to, to, to match this, and then you designing for that. But I'm curious about the conversations that you had with the personal side of her life, rather, Judy's mm -hmm. life, sure. the personal side of Judy's life, the conversations that you had with Renee, rather than the public image, of how those conversations developed between you. In the, in the development of the costumes? Well, she, she came for the first fitting, and the minute that she entered the room, she started putting her shoulder like that in the front and her belly to sort of half circle. And I thought the dress is never going to fit <laughs> because that is a hunchback. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, oh, ho. <laughs> I put the dress on her. Of course, everything was falling apart because it was not with that posture. You have to fit it specially. So we redid it. Um, and miraculously, it was holding on the shoulder. And then I was thinking during the orphan, because we had no money, it was a very small budget. So I just had one dress. 
So every time she was putting that dress on, I was thinking, I hope nothing happened. <laughs> you know, no coffee, no thing, no lunch. No, you imagine? I mean, we all, we all have been in that position, so we know what it is. And I also hope that she will never straight up to walk because then the dress is gone. Huh? And I just had one. But because she's such an incredible actress and a super pro, she always walked like that in that dress and it was fine. And that was, you know, for me, such a relief because the minute she was stepping in the costume, she was being Judy Garland. She, the motoric was extraordinary, that she kept that. It's such, you know, a, a, a hard work physically, but she did it. She, she, I mean, she has been a tremendous help. I mean, she was, she gave to all by design a, a, a life beyond what I could expect because she made them incredibly alive. She gave them a soul, you know, it was fantastic. It was really the, I mean, I've been working for lots, lots, lots of many years, but um, my collaboration with René Selwig on, on that film was extraordinary. So these three films focus on, on specific moments in time, and then we, we come to The Irishman, which is this vast epic spanning so many decades. Um, I watched the film again two days ago, and what stunned me about it is that unlike most films that take us decade by decade through someone's life, you, you, you don't have the marker of this is the 1940s, the 1950s. There's this bleed that happens. And I think anyone who's lived in more, as an adult in more than one or two decades realizes that you don't go, hey, it's the 2000s, I take these off and I put these on now. And it's, it's lovely, it's quite amazing, but I'm just curious of how easy was it to, to find ways of transitioning through costume, through the era? You know, I don't I think we really thought about it at the time, the, as far as you know, the, that full transition you know, from the beginning to the end. It's interesting now looking at the film and seeing some of Bob's first looks and then forgetting about all the ones in the middle and then going to him to the I end. Huh? <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so, we, so, you know, we, we approach every scene, you know, with costuming them for the, the age that each of these men were supposed to be at the moment they were supposed to be that age. And, and just put it all together on these enormous boards. And then that's, it sort of tracks through, but it does bleed, you know, from one to the next. And what remains constant is, is character and certain things that they the way people dress, that carries through all of the decades. I mean, what's, what's interesting is that, you, you know, you think of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. That moment doesn't actually happen until after halfway through a decade, I don't think. So you get the early 60s looks like the 50s. The late 60s, you can sort of see the 70s happening. Mm. So it is a sort of subtle transition between all of them. As Christopher said, the only way we could actually see it was by putting everybody in chronological order on these boards, even though the film jumps around between all the periods. I, I actually grew up in Wales, and I don't think I had my first pair of flares till about 1983, 84. <laughs> it was, it's a very painful experience. Um, there's a fascinating thing for me watching a film, of, of seeing where there's a kind of an emotional in through a costume that a character wears, and, and with Jojo Rabbit maze, um, again, it's finding that balance between comedy and pathos, and, and for me, Sam Rockwell, was quite astonishing, especially the outfit he wears when he goes into battle. I did take his captain uh, uniform just as it was, and then I started to add like the trims and the little velvet trims around the uh, around the collar, and then put more fringes and like more crazy fringes. And I have to cut back a lot because then it was getting to a point and was like. Yes, yeah, really Mardi Gras, and uh, <laughs> so I have to like say no, no, this is too much. So I took, you know, taking and putting together just like basic trims, like super basic trims, and uh, the idea of the plume, like you know, the like the uh, carabinieri from Italy have yeah. this plume, and then um, you know, make it very. Uh, below it. it. It was a lot of fun. And uh, Sam had a lot to do with it because when he came to me and I said, well, you know, we're going to do this. And he said, well, just think of me like if I was Bill Murray. 
And uh, this, is, this is what I'm channeling to really play this character. And it helped me a lot because it gave me that freedom of uh, adding uh, you know, comedy to his costume. So going back to the temperature of the movie and the colors, we went from very vibrant to really uh, you know, going into like sad and then back again, you know, happy again. So because it does have a happy ending. Uh, this movie, and uh, that was a lot of fun. It was great. And Ariane, um, again, coming back to the conversations that you were having with Quentin and then going off on your own, did you find with each of the characters you had sort of an in, there was a piece of clothing or something that you thought, this is something that's, that's going to be the starting point for their representation, such as the yellow T-shirt? The Brad Pitts. Absolutely. Good fortune was I found um, in a deep box at Warner Brothers costume, I found a belt buckle that's, uh, if you were stuntman at that time, you could order one of these belt buckles. It says Hollywood Stuntman's Association from 61 to 71. So I found that and that became kind of Cliff's talisman for his character and we all loved it and it was like so cool. And then, um, uh, I had a medallion made for Rick Dalton with his initial on it um, in that kind of Steve McQueen, cool guy, a little bit of ego. Um, so that became his talisman. And then for Margot's character, for Sharon Tate, Deborah Tate, Sharon's sister, was a consultant on our film. And um, at that time, uh, the time we were shooting, she was preparing for the first time ever in 50 years an auction of some of Sharon's personal items. So I got to see the clothes. Uh, There's some clothes and some luggage and some jewelry, and I got to see and touch everything. And of course, uh, Deborah gave me all kinds of beautiful anecdotes about her. And I asked her if it would be possible to borrow some of the jewelry, not because it was, very, it was just insignificant costume jewelry. It wasn't anything valuable or or particularly memorable, but the fact that it belonged to Sharon, I thought it might be a great touchstone for Margot. And you know, those items, I believe, are really like assists for the actors, right? They're kind of little talisman, and whether they're into it or not, in this case, they all use them as kind of character-defining accessories, so that was super helpful. But you know, that's funny that you say that because I gave to René the Chanel bag of my mother because we, I had them, I had a Chanel bag, all the jewelry of my mother, you know, the clip from the, from the 60, and I say, well, I cannot find anything better than that. Oh, and it yeah. is so fantastic, because when you are doing 68, you still can have original stuff. Sure. And they help, that help the actors and the actresses so much, because they have something with an history, and they love that. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, I think that costumes are, I always say, are like a beam me up suit, they should, serve two roles, right? To inform the character, create the character, inform the story, move the story along for the audience visually, but then also as a tactile, physical assist for the actors. Not all, not all actors work that way, but in case they do, <laughs> it's an opportunity for them to yeah. really inhabit and kind of beam, me, beam them to that character. Yeah, the materials are key. You know, uh, you can have materials that uh, can make a, a costume iconic or a scene, whole scene iconic, like I see all my colleagues have wonderful, you know, visuals on that, on their work. And this, uh, it's good to adapt it to a character, it's good to adapt it to a film <laughs> and the color. When all that comes together, it's like painting on a canvas and you have the right colors for the, like the right oil, you know, uh, paintings, and then you have the uh, results you wanted to have, that you have in your mind. And Johnny, um, if we saw a clip from uh, the performance of a trolley song, yeah, that outfit alone is, is magnificent. Um, I've had the pleasure of interviewing you in the past and, and know how exacting you are about exactly the kind of materials that you want to use. And for this film, uh, how much of a challenge did you find it? I use, we had no money. And that was a big challenge, and I had so many costumes to do, so I tried to gather as much vintage that I found. And uh, what you see now, what uh, she was dancing in, the top is a Lanvin Castillo uh, dress 
from the 70s, I shorter it a little bit and I made a golden trouser to match it because um, it was not possible to have all those costumes made. So I squatted at Angel's for three months <laughs> and I, <laughs> I looked in all there and they have incredible stock that they don't even know themselves, you know, the beauties of the fabric that they have all the original, and I was really gathering all the buttons, all the, all the fabric that I could find, all the original, between all those rails, you know, pulling and well, <laughs> all the dust coming up. And I found beauties. And we made, uh, I made for Renee, let's say, 12 of her costumes, and the rest are all originals. The Irishman in suits, Harvey Cartel is, at the top of the food chain, and he is smartly and tightly dressed, and then we're working our way down. Even thinking about the, the opening scene of a film in the old people's home with De Niro there, even though he's got that waistcoat with the, um, the, the shirt that well, looks like a dress shirt or something, and, and just jogging pants, but the fact is, you compare him, he might not look great, but compare him to all the people sat around That's him. Exactly. That's, that and he's still in this class of his own. Yeah. Um, that costume is based on a photograph of the actual Frank Sheeran that we received from uh, members of his family. I mean, and the components of it are essentially, because the, the, the whole film is a rumination on, you know, a life of, you know, compromising bad choices. I mean, that, that's, that's the backbone of the film. And so in that moment, in the nursing home, we decided based on the photograph and based on, you know, our discussions with Robert De Niro, um, that, that it could be an amalgam of pieces from most of the decades that we saw him through. Not all of them, but it was a 70s shirt that he'd worn in the 70s section. It was a vest from one of his three-piece 80s suits. His... Um, and the, the trainers, we call them here, not sneakers. Trainers. Trainers. Uh, <laughs> and, and the track pants. Yeah, and... Were, and yeah, just and it, the comfort wear, like old man comfort wear. And then the point of that also was that um, we wanted to make it all a bit oversized so that he looked small and vulnerable. Whereas when we were doing him in younger, we younger days, we were building him up. We were making him a bit taller and building his shoulders up more. And we were sort of doing the reverse here and sort of trying to make him look sort of more vulnerable, really. But the bit that stands out, obviously, is he's still got, we see the watch and the ring and the, and the glasses and the cap. You still fly. I, I, I can't move on, I can't have you two on stage and not bring up Stephen Graham in Miami. <laughs> Those tight-fitting white shorts and that Bermuda top and the Gucci loafers, I think, and the sunglasses. It's, it's that so age. funny, this is the most talked about costume. It is fabulous. But it's a great scene as well. And yeah. of course, it wouldn't look the same on any other actor. I mean, Stephen Graham was amazing. It's how it's worn. Yeah. It's how it's worn and, and, and what the scene was. And I think, you know, we could, we could put that same outfit on somebody else and it wouldn't do the same thing. Yeah, but that's what actors are. I mean, you, um, you know, each one have a personality that they bring in. And I mean, it's, it's never the same when we, when we have to fit an actor on his double because he's not available and it looks terrible and yeah, then you put it on the it. actors and then it is... I got to do that in the movie. Oh. <laughs> like the double costume. Yeah. Like that oh, was yeah, super fun did. on camera because yeah, we see that all the time. Exactly. Yeah, the, and you have to and we the purposely difference. made it not... And, not so, and it's not the same costume. It, is, it looks so bad and then <laughs> on your actor it looks so wonderful. <laughs> well, the problem yeah. for me was it was Brad Pitt and everything looks good on him. <laughs> <laughs> Everything looks good on Robert Evan when he takes off his shirt. Yeah. That was the, that, that's, my, <laughs> that's the favorite costume. That's your favorite costume. <laughs> the one everyone talks about. Yeah. <laughs> everyone was on set that day. Everyone in, all 20 people in my department, everyone was. <laughs> we are going so far off track. <laughs> are we? I'm not well, sure. Well, <laughs> behave. Right. Um, <laughs> I am unfortunately getting a signal that we, we do have to bring this to a close. Uh, thank you very, very much to Swarovski for their support of this event and also of the BAFTAs. Um, also to BAFTA themselves for organising this event. But most of all, can you please join me in thanking our guests today. Thank you.